Hi, this is Chris Allison, and this is the Genesis Ag Podcast. I'm here today with Philip and Josh Davis. Philip is a company founder and president, and Josh serves as vice president of Genesis Ag. Today, they will be discussing the rising cost of fertilizer inputs and the impact that may have on the 2022 growing season. They will also discuss how improving soil biology can help reduce overall input costs during a time when paying for or even finding fertilizer can be very challenging. I'm Josh Davis. We're here in North Carolina on our home farm doing a little bit of harvest work. We've shelled some corn, started in some beans. Our beans are still a little bit too wet to do anything. We've been fielding calls, looking at things in our own fields, trying to learn things for next year. And throughout all the calls that we've been fielding, looking forward for 2022, we've been presented with the same question over and over again is, what am I going to do for 2022? As every input that we have going into agriculture is seemingly going through the roof, people are asking themselves, what do I do? Because our relative commodity prices aren't fluctuating the same as what our input prices are. So here today, we've got my dad, Philip Davis, president of Genesis Ag, here to maybe talk about some points that we can look forward to 2022 on some resolutions and maybe some alternatives going forward. Josh, I'm 62 years old. And so one of the things that has very dramatically changed our world is what we've experienced with this pandemic. And we met back in in our home office and we had a group discussion there about tagline for who we are and what we're doing at Genesis Ag. And we came up with change how you grow. And who would have thought that 18 months ago that we would be experiencing as much change as we are currently in the world and how fast this has taken place. And so anytime that there's a need for change, it's hard to adjust for us sometimes. And I think a lot of times the reason it's difficult for us to adjust is mainly fear. And because we know that change may reveal our shortcomings, it may reveal things that we're not really fully knowledgeable of. And I think that's what's happened in this whole situation is we're really uncertain. And you're expressing now that you're getting calls every day of the uncertainty the uncertainty in this market. And I printed out some numbers yesterday from DTN shared from September of 2020 and until now about what our inputs are. And when I say it's 70 to uh, 95% increase in pricing on those commodities that, that you just spoke of that these that our farmers are gonna have to experience going into this next season. And it's not even price that they're looking at is some of them may not have certain inputs like phosphorus or potassium or certain micronutrients available to them that they've been accustomed to using in the past as well. So it's not just as much price as availability. And if you're not thinking about that now and thinking about alternatives or options, and I think that's what we want to do at Genesis Ag is really provide some options. If you know that, okay, I'm only going to have or be able to afford, let me put it like that, 50% of the nitrogen that I commonly put on a crop, how can I work with that? Or if I can't get phosphorus, the availability of uh, even being able to obtain phosphorus is a struggle right now. The the big, large suppliers, are, they're, they're questioning, can I get enough? So if you can't get about half as much phosphorus out or whatever, What's your options? What's your alternatives? And that's where we are. So in your perspective, what are some things that we could look at as far as bridging the gap between the money that that a guy could spend that he's been accustomed to spending and trying to utilize the nutrients that he's been putting out there? Let's take the air that we breathe contains a little bit over 70% nitrogen 
how can a farmer grasp that nitrogen and give it to the plant or to the soil? We've always associated nitrogen fixing bacteria with soybeans. And so in, in our time of working together, uh, you and I, we've experienced that we're able to put that same, some of the same logic to a grass crop like corn that we can supply those nitrogen fixing bacteria for that corn crop in that some of those will actually suffice for a great need, the nitrogen need in that crop. So it's different thinking, it's different way of thinking, it's different way of looking at things. By us being able to supply that nitrogen fixing bacteria to a, a grass crop like corn. So something similar like we've been doing here on our home farm the last two years is dramatically backing off of the nitrogen inputs while maintaining yield. Now there are some catches to that, like timing and, and application, but where we've dramatically backed off to less than 100 pounds of applied nitrogen and still growing 200 plus bushel corn, even higher than that in some of our better fields, is there a relativity that we could pass over to a new farmer that could be working with us or someone that's been working with us in the past that's not had exposure to a certain product like a nitrogen fixing bacteria that they could integrate and start a ball rolling on a pathway. Okay, you laid out a prime example there for me to click off on and that is our typical farm and you're cut back to about 100 pounds of nitrogen applied nitrogen, but you have a theory and you have a program that you're following to do that. You're not just going out and putting on 100 units of N at one time. You have a logical program, and I'll let you get into that in a minute. But also, the farms that we've been managing for a longer period of time, I think I heard in, in your explanation that we're getting even a higher yield than 200 bushels off 100 units of applied in because we've got the biological program working there and we've been managing for that. And so I think that what we have found out, if we allow this bacteria to work, if we don't front load it with, with nitrogen and we're allowing that corn crop to say, here's what I need and it's sending out the root exudates that signal those nitrogen fixing bacteria to work they're working and supplying a tremendous amount of that in for that. So similar to what we've been trying here uh, on our farm is looking at what the soil can handle at a specific time because all of the commercial fertilizer that we have access to are essentially high salt fertilizers. There's very few in the industry that don't contain the salt. So we're looking at being more biologically friendly along with looking at particular timings that we know we can apply and gradually increasing that as the plant gets larger, especially in a corn crop, to facilitate certain needs. It, it's just like a young seedling as it sprouts, it doesn't need 50 to 100 pounds of nitrogen two inches away because it's much like feeding a, a infant baby. It doesn't like anything saltier with a bad taste. A, a seed germinating would be in the same aspect of that. So looking at a similar instance to what we're doing here is applying what we feel on our farm between 20 and 25 pounds of applied in at planting a little bit further than two inches away just gets the plant off and going. Then we come back with subsequent applications at certain timings to feed the crop on out while allowing the nitrogen fixing bacteria that we've been applying to really function and carry the crop out throughout the whole season. And I think that is a is an area that we've all not understood, that if we let that plant ask for something, that it's much better than having an overabundance of it. When I'm talking about in the biological world, because really that plant is, is signaling and sending out those root exudates that this is what I need. And if it's feeding that nitrogen fixing bacteria, and it's saying, hey, this is what I want you to do, and it's sending that signal, then they're having a great day. But when we over apply early, these salt, heavy salt fertilizers like you're talking about, you actually suppress that activity. 
Then when we get into that rapid growing conditions, the biological activity can't keep up. And that's the same thing with nitrogen, phosphorus, all of the nutrients that, that need to go into that plant, if we're not getting them solubilized by the soil bacteria, it, it, it's not gonna get into the plant. So you mentioned another nutrient there in, in phosphorus. What's your take on phosphorus and how a guy can go forward with phosphorus with it being six to 800, maybe even higher by the time the growing season rolls around, possibly 900 bucks a ton for phosphorus, like a map or a DAP? The thing about it is, Josh, and, and we've gotten into where we're doing a total extraction on the nutrients in, in the soil. And when we do that, it's much like, uh, it's, it's with a stronger extraction than an omega-3. So when we have the abundance, and I say overabundance, when we have hundreds of pounds of phosphorus out there on some of these farms, but it's not bioavailable. So we're finding if we put the correct biology out there that starts solubilizing that locked up phosphorus, we can get that into the plant. We can make that available so that it's not tidal and it's not a nutrient that's bound in the soil because what's the percentage of phosphorus on the average soil that is actually available? Maybe two to three percent. Yeah. yeah. So why don't we unlock some of it that's out there and utilize that because we pay for it. During my 40 some years of farming, I paid for a lot of phosphorus and it's out there, so why can't I tap into that and utilize some of that in, in a stressful time like this or a time of uncertainty, can I get it? And if I can get it, why am I gonna pay three times more than I should for it? Right, so looking at phosphorus, probably the most tied up nutrient <clears throat> that, that we apply as farmers with it tying up to calcium, to aluminum, and certain other nutrients out there, how can we speed up that process to unlock what pea we've got in the soil? Because from what we've looked at in the top six inches of the soil, we've got anywhere from 800 to 2,000 pounds, and this is nationwide soil data that we've looked at, 800 to 2,000 pounds, we've got it out there. How can we speed up that process to, to get it working for us. One of the things we, and, and I say this change, is we're experiencing change in our personal life. We have to look at farming and we have to look at, okay, change and adapting. So our common practices that we've been using for the past 50 years, we may have to start reevaluating those. So if I'm looking at, okay, I have, a certain amount of biology out there that's native or we couldn't grow a crop. And you know that I've always said this, that the yield you're getting is your soil's biological capacity to release. If we're gonna get more nutrients released to this crop, we have to improve that biology. So a food source would be key. And I'm not talking about just an average food source. That would be a really good energy source for the bacteria and fungi that we're trying to have present there. And also introducing the correct bacteria and fungi to make these nutrients soluble. So an, another avenue to look at this for people that, that may be hesitant about it, where they've always been told well, what you take off, you've got to put back. How many times do you feel like a pound of phosphorus can be reused in a soil cycle? Typically, right now, it's used one time in a soil cycle. With, when I say with the average sequence only farm, because you apply it and you may get one to three percent the second year, and then it's about one percent per year. So it's a very you know, long-term process. But what we could do is we could get to utilizing that phosphorus as many as 70 times, 70 crop cycles that we could get the utilization of that pound of applied phosphorus if we're in a good biological program. And looking at getting a good biological program, how do we feel like that that could start? I know we've hit on nitrogen and phosphorus here, but how do we feel like that could start? Is it getting things started in the spring once a, 
a season break storm at sea because we're working with people as far south as southern Texas and as far north as the Canadian border in a lot of cases. So we're going from a no, no freeze cycle in Texas to someone possibly freezing in November to March, looking at a broad spectrum approach. How can every person that we could potentially reach out to, how could they get that cycle going and what's the best avenue to do that? I read an article this morning in a no-till publication that we're in the October, so they're saying the only cover crop to do is cereal. Everybody wants to talk about covers, and that's really good part of this biological program. But what we're finding out is in all of these scenarios, where you're working in the deep south or you're working in the far north, if we can get our biology, or I, I will say the correct biology, in the seed trench, you talked about that germinating seed, get that to start colonizing on that plant early, I feel like that's the key. It's really the key to making this whole process. So essentially what you're saying is to integrate biology to a capacity of maximum effect in year one, we essentially need a host. So like applying that either on the seed for a particular product or integrating that in furrow, or if we don't have either of those abilities, it would be foliar applying at an early stage where root development has started and really starting to take off and getting the biology active that way. Well, that's all the time we have for today. I'd like to thank uh, Philip and Josh for being with us, and I'd like to thank everyone else for joining us here. I hope you can be with us again very soon for the next version of the Genesis Ag Podcast. Have a great day. 